Okay, guys, we're gonna go through uh, your next your next part of this. So the next unit that we're gonna cover is really gonna cover the creation of the Constitution uh, and a couple of our early presidencies, uh, and then through uh, basically the War of 1812, which I will teach you as our second War of Independence. Okay, uh, so this is a fairly substantial uh, unit. There's gonna be a, a lot of information to cover. I, I apologize about the reading yesterday. It just never got uploaded, so you can get a freebie. Right? So don't like a freebie, like F R E B I E freebie. Okay? Um, yeah, I'm right, just gonna uh, put 100 on it and we'll move one away. Okay? Uh, but basically, it's just one less reading that you'll have to do for the semester. It's my fault, not yours. All right. So what we're gonna talk about today is the creation of our constitutional republic. All right. So. What we ended with in our last unit, we ended with the uh, the Articles of Confederation, right? And then what was the ultimate crisis that came out of the Articles of Confederation? Shay's Rebellion, right? Shay's Rebellion is our ultimate failure. We can't put it down, we got problems. So we're gonna get together, we're gonna have a new convention, all right, where we first aim to fix the Articles of Confederation, but that's not gonna work. So we're gonna write a whole new document. We're gonna write this, uh, this Constitution of the United States of America. So, Anytime we write any document, anytime we write anything, right? And understand that this is no different than the Declaration of Independence. It's basically an essay. Yeah, this is the Constitution, right? So in any good essay, what do you do in the first paragraph? Explain what you're going to talk about. Explain what you're doing, right? So we the people. Who? The people. Us. Yes? Of the United States. In order to form a more perfect union, Right? So the goal is to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. You ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. There you go. That is a list of what we are setting out to do. Okay? Some of that should be relatively easy to grasp, some of it slightly more difficult, right? Okay? General welfare, just general well being. The government ought to work for you, not the other way around, right? Justice. Obviously, we want to live in a just society, yes? Right? So whatever laws Leslie has to live under, I have to live under the same laws. Right? Common defense. Yeah? We don't want to be attacked and slaughtered by the Canadians. Okay? Not the Canada would ever attack us. Right? And then finally, uh, the, the other one that sort of matters there is general domestic tranquility. What does that mean? Yeah, just peace, peace at home. Tranquility is just peace. Domestic means at home, right? And if we do all of that, we will have secured the blessings of liberty and like life will be good. Yeah? Okay, so now once we have established that, right, we've got the purpose. Now we've got to figure out how we're actually going to go about accomplishing this. Yes? The first thing that we have to realize is the United States is a very diverse nation. Even in 1787, we are a very diverse nation. Okay? Despite the fact that the population of the United States in 1787 is only 3.5 million, okay? those 3.5 million people are not homogenous. They're not one and the same. So we've got to take into, these, into account these different groups. We have New England merchants. right? You need to hear New England merchants and think capitalists. You know what a capitalist is? No, thank you for your honesty. Capitalists would be people like Elon Musk. No, everybody wants money. I mean, nobody in here wants to be poor, right? Okay, I was just checking. We all want money. Capitalists are the people with like like large wealth that would be large industry owners, right? So when we say New England merchants, think John Hancock. Yes, first millionaire in American history. Southern planters. Who are they? Plantation owners, specifically. Planters is plantations. Farmers are farmers. Okay? So the first two groups that you have seen here, you need to recognize both of them are elite groups. Yes? Okay? Number three, royalists. Okay, these are people that had a vested government, that had a vested interest in the government that existed previously, right? And 
people who would have a vested interest in the government that existed previously would be those people that had some sort of governmental protection, right? Meaning they had protections of like land, that the government said that they owned land that was undeveloped, they still want to be able to own that land. Or arguably more important, right? People that hold patents. You know what a patent is? So that's what it does. But all it is is a document, right? Really all it is is a number, okay? You submit your invention, your design, whatever it is that you have created, right? The government patents it, and the reason that they patent it is because you have spent a lot of time and effort and energy, blood, sweat, and tears in creating whatever it is that you created, yes? <clears throat> you ought to be able to profit off of it if it is successful before anybody else can. Okay? And then after some time, patents will expire, and then anybody can make that product, and then the value or the cost of the product goes down drastically because there's a whole bunch of competition. But you have gotten to recoup your money. That is a governmental protection that exists. All right? Shopkeepers, artisans, laborers, that is what you should think of as the middle class in today's society. Right? Artisans would mean uh, blacksmiths, right? Or goldsmiths. Right? People that are working with their hands that are making things skilled labor. Okay? Different than unskilled labor, but skilled labor. And then finally, sort of yeoman farmers. Have I used that term before? No. Yeoman farmers would be small farms. Sometimes I use the term sustenance farming. Have I used that term? Yes? Okay, good. Okay? Similar sorts of concepts. But what you need to realize all five of these groups are distinct, they're unique. They have different wants, needs, and desires. And if we're gonna create one nation to oversee all of them, we've gotta figure out how to make everybody happy. All right? So when we get to the convention, we're gonna to try to figure out how to make everybody happy. We need to take into account economic interests, right? And then we need to take into account basically uh, political theories, right? And governing theories and, and the actual principles of creating a government, right? Uh, because you have to have clearly defined sort of rules and regulations and restrictions and things like that. So the first thing that we're going to deal with, very first thing that we're going to deal with, if we're creating a government, who gets to participate? Right? Well, it's we the people, right? And so just, just so we're clear, we're going to create a democratic form of government, right? So we have a democracy, right? Democracy is, is Greek, right? It translates to power of the people, okay? So, we're going to create a government in which the people are empowered to do things. Did we have a democracy under the Articles of Confederation? Technically, yes. Right? We have an efficient democracy under the Articles of Confederation. Right? But we had elective representatives. Well, we had a republic. We had elective representatives that went to the congressional body under the Articles of Confederation and they voted on stuff. We're going to maintain the same system, the same structure, the same basic idea now. Okay? So what that means is, is we're going to create a legislative body. So if we create a legislative body that is going to rule, then we have to ask, how are we going to decide how many people are in the legislative body and where they come from? And so we're going to come up with two different plans. There's two different groups that are going to put their plan forward for how representation is going to occur. The first is called the Virginia Plan. That is the large state plan. Virginia had a very large population. They wanted proportional representation, okay? That is what we think of today in terms of one person, one vote, right? Everybody is equally represented across the entirety of the United States, proportional, okay? So for instance, at this time, for every 40,000 people, you would have one representative. Okay. The small state plan, that was the large state plan, the small state plan is equal representation by the various states. That means every state is equal. Okay. So Virginia and its very large population would be equal in Congress to New Hampshire and its very small population. Okay. Under the Articles of Confederation, which of those two did we have? <clears throat> We had the small state plan. Every state had an equal say. They all got one vote. Okay? All right? So those are the two options. What do we actually go with? 
Both. We have the Connecticut Compromise and the Great Compromise. And I need you to understand, I don't know which one it's going to show up as on the test. Test, I might say Great Compromise. I might say Connecticut Compromise. Okay? Either one is fair game on the test. Okay? But this is a compromise of the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan. And so what we do is we create a bicameral legislation. Bi means two. Two. So now we've got two chambers. We have the House of Representatives. Right? And the House of Representatives is going to utilize which plan? The big one. I'm all right with that. The Virginia plan. Yes? Okay. The House of Representatives is proportional in representation. Here in the state of Texas, we have 38 representatives. Because everybody wants to live in Texas. Right? In Wyoming, they've got one. Nobody wants to live in Wyoming. Actually, Wyoming is beautiful. But I will tell you this. If you've never had to dig your car out of a snowstorm, that'll make you rethink living somewhere like that permanently. Right? Uh, it can get wildly depressing when you can't leave your house for like a week. I agree with your Yeah. Okay. Right? So, um, the House of Representatives is going to become the proportional plan. The Senate will become the equal representation plan. Right? Equal representation amongst the several states. In the House of or excuse me, in the Senate, every individual state will get two votes. Every individual state will get two senators in the House and the Senate. All right? So that's the Connecticut Compromise. Now, if we're going to have proportional representation, we got to know how many people exist, don't we? That's actually in the Constitution. We have to conduct a census. Do we know that word? The census is what we count every 10 years. Every 10 years, we count the census, right? Did one in 2000, 2010, 2020, right? And when we count the census, when we count where everybody lives, your parents filled something out. Your, your parents just said, you, you, you and me and you, you, mom, dad, all legit, you brothers and sisters, you look kind of X number of people live in your house, right? Uh, and then they mailed it back in. In 2020, I'm pretty sure you do it online. I don't think in 2010, I don't remember, in 2010 somebody came to my house. Literally, they have, they have census workers that go door to door in large city. I live like in downtown uh, San, uh, San Diego. Kind of. Then I mean, they got paid. They were actual federal employees. They weren't volunteers. Right? Um, but this is the census. So the census is going to be tell us every 10 years. But this is the census. So the census is going to tell us every 10 years where people have moved. Right? So if you pay attention to like, Government. This is really more for government for next year. Because obviously we're talking about the Constitution and debt. Right? We notice that people are leaving California because California sucks. Right? And they're moving to Texas. Because Texas is awesome. I, I mean. Well, aren't they still doing that during the United Kingdom? What? A lot of people from California are coming to Texas. So lots of people are coming to Texas just in general. Yeah. But lots of people are leaving California in general. Right? Um, and so when, when we had the 2020 census, Right, the state of Texas picked up two seats. The state of California lost the seat. Right, but California lost the seat. Oregon gained one. Montana gained one. Yeah, people moved to Montana. People leaving California went to Montana. Right, like Leslie said about Wyoming. I mean, Montana is basically the same place. It's very pretty. Right, they just, they just Montana is also almost twice the size of Wyoming in terms of like land mass. Okay. So now we've got to figure out how many people exist, yes, in order to determine pro proportional representation. So what are we going to do about our slaves? Right? Well, here's here's what I need you to understand, right? This is going to get into early hypocrisy within American history. Yes, we understand that America is founded sort of hypocritically. We have the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. Yeah, we got slaves. Right? Okay. So uh, obviously that's already hypocritical in the United States. Now we're going to get more hypocritical. Okay. So for proportional representational purposes, right, who wants the slaves to count? The slave owning states, the southern states, right? They want slaves to count for representation purposes, right? Because if you live in South Carolina, where there was a really high percentage of slaves, right, compared to other states, 
that might provide you with an extra two, three, four seats in the House of Representatives that obviously you're not filling with black people, right? You're filling them with other plantation owners, other elites within South Carolina. And okay? so what does Rhode Island want? Right? They, they don't want slaves to count. Slaves are not citizens. By the way, do Native Americans count? They do not. Right? Even the ones that are not, I mean, they're not enslaved, but they don't count. Okay? Okay? Um, now, you should also realize, though, that people equate to money. Yeah? Okay, so the government has to generate revenue. One of the ways the government generates revenue is, is essentially like uh, contributions from the states, and those contributions are based in part upon population. So now, if you're Virginia, do you want your slaves to count? No. Because if they count, now you have to give more money to the national government. Right? What about Rhode Island? Does Rhode Island now want them to count? Yes. Because then Rhode Island can give less money proportionally to the United States government. So, does Rhode Island want black people, slaves, to count toward population? The answer is, depends. Is it beneficial to me? Population purposes, Rhode Island says no. Taxation purposes, Rhode Island says yes. Virginia says the opposite, okay? Again, hypocrisy. Is that part of the way we get up to the three of this compromise? So, now, we're gonna create our bicameral legislature. We know that we have a government of we the people, right? We're gonna create a democracy. What do we need to do, right? What are the goals in our democracy? All right, number one, we understand that what was the biggest thing, if we either summarize the flaw of the Articles of Confederation in one word, what word would we use? We, who said that? Thank you, ma'am. Weak, right, it's weak. That's what makes it a family though. Right? It fails because it is weak, right? So that means we need to create a new government that is strong, strong. absolutely. Okay, we need a strong government. Yes, ma'am. Well, strong more so in enforcing. Well, strong it requires enforcement. You can't you can't have a strong government if you can't enforce the laws. Yeah. Right. But we need to be able to pass laws. See, one of the things that we might not remember, maybe we didn't go over enough detail, but the Articles of Confederation, in order to even pass a law, what did you need? You needed 13 of 13 votes. You needed what's called unanimous consent. We can't get that. Can't get that. Because at least someone doesn't. Yeah, you're always going to have some naysayers somewhere. Yeah. Right? And now. Predominantly, we again go back to the very beginning of this. What are we trying to do? Promote general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty, yada yada yada, right? So, we need a strong government that does what? That protects our economic interests, right? No, I why I asked. I asked at the beginning of this lecture, anybody in here trying to be poor in life? Of course not. Right? So we have economic interests, we want the government to protect them. That also means protecting private property. Right, a lot more difficult to, to prosper economically if you don't have private property. Okay? However, it is important to note that our founders are already beginning to understand the concept or the idea that too strong a government would also be very, very bad. Okay? If we had an excessively strong government, right, we could have a government that could do all sorts of things that would be wildly detrimental to the welfare of the nation, right? We might have a government that decides you can't wear leggings. Leggings are inappropriate in life, therefore you cannot wear. You understand if the guy, if they, this is the government, right? You understand if school is government, yes? If this school had too much authority, too much power, could they do that? Yeah, what would you do about it? Can't do anything about it, right? In fact, on the PowerPoint, it calls this excessive democracy, but I need you to understand that excessive democracy is synonymous with another term, right? So if we think about this for a second, what is democracy? Power. Rule of the people, yes? Right, the people have the power, and okay, that's called majority rule. Gotcha? What does excessive mean? Too much. Too much. Okay, so if we say ex uh, excessive democracy, what we're actually saying is too much power of the people. 
That is also sometimes referred to as tyranny of the majority. Okay? If the majority of us in this room decided that the brown-eyed people all get an advantage on the test, right? How many of you would be in favor of that? Everybody with brown eyes, yes? No, 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 because I need you to understand, you're going to vote in your own best interest, always. People will always do what is in their own best interest. The majority will do what is in their own best interest, okay? The majority can and will, if given the opportunity, become tyrannical. I need you to recognize that, okay? Government will always become tyrannical if given the opportunity. That means that government will abuse its power. Okay? Because if this were a democracy, and do not confuse this for a democracy, this is a dictatorship. Okay? But if this were a democracy, could y'all democratically decide that everybody gets an A in this class regardless? Yes. Sure you could. Right? Yeah. Right? At that point, what happens? How many of you would continue to learn anything? A couple of you might, because you enjoy learning or you find this topic interesting. Right? But for most of us, what are we doing? Man, I got my A, I'm out. Okay? So government in excessive democracy abuse will occur. Right? I mean, not that this class is going to save a life at some point in time, but imagine if you did that in a science class, in a pre month uh, of a medical class. Yeah. Just decide that everybody gets an A. Everybody gets to be a doctor. Right? Democracy says, you want to be a doctor, you can be a doctor. Guess what's going to happen to people? People are going to die. Right? People are going to die because we have doctors that have no business being doctors. Right? That is a result of excessive democracy. So, if, if excessive democracy, if tyranny of the majority is the ultimate end goal, sorry, not end goal, right, but the ultimate outcome, okay, if it is the inevitable outcome of government, how do we stop tyranny of the majority from happening? Well, we've got to figure out ways to limit government. One of them, one, one of many will be separation of powers, yes, ma'am. Okay, so what is separation of powers? Keeping the branches in check of each other. Three branches, excellent. We're going straight back to third grade, yes? Right, we yeah, all third grade. The executive branch, executive branch, legislative, executive, and judicial. Okay? Now, again, when we compare that to the Articles of Confederation, the Articles of Confederation had how many branches? One! It just had a legislative branch. That's it. That's all it had. So we're going to divide power between the three. Now, I also need you to understand when I say divide power, Right? When I say divide power, I need you to realize this. I'm not talking about diluting power. You know what that means? So here's the thing. I've got three branches, yes? Okay? Diluting power right, would basically be taking all of the different, because you understand there's different types of power, yes? Yeah. Okay, in fact, we know that over here we make law, that's one power, here we enforce law, that's a different power, right, and here we interpret law, that is yet a third power, okay? Diluting would be saying that this branch makes, enforces, and interprets law, this branch makes, enforces, and interprets law, this branch makes, enforces, and interprets law. We don't do that. We don't dilute it, right, by just spreading out all of the power in a bunch of different places. Instead, we pull out the individual powers and put them in various places. You understand that? Mm -hmm. right? That means that the legislative branch is responsible for making laws, making rules. The executive branch is responsible for enforcing those rules, and the judicial branch is responsible for interpreting how those rules are meant to be followed and whether or not those rules are in line with the expectations and the requirements of the Constitution. All right? Now, with that comes the concept of checks and balances, but I need you to understand checks and balances and separation of powers 
are not the same thing. They're not interchangeable. Okay? But you will see eventually over here, right, this is responsible for like the, the judicial branch, right, will be responsible for convictions. Yes? Right? Leslie committed a crime. Okay? He is convicted. Right? But we're going to have checks. So now let's say Leslie didn't actually do anything, or let's just say for the sake of argument, Leslie's crime is marijuana. Is that a real crime? I mean, not really anymore, right? It's not in California, or Oregon, or Colorado, or Washington, or like half the states. Oklahoma legalized marijuana, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so over here now, Over here we have pardons. Now, if this branch has utilized, pay attention, if this branch has utilized their power in a manner that is detrimental to the welfare of the nation as a whole, this branch can check their power. Okay? Well, they don't all check each other. The checks are very specific. Which is why I don't want you to conflate checks and balances with separation of power. Okay? Not exactly one and the same. All right? I don't really care that much about divided constituencies, but basically it's just a differentiation between, like, the American system and the English system. Okay? We are all represented by very specific individuals. Right? In fact, here in, like, 19 days, y'all will go vote for your representative. I will go vote for mine. My representative is different than your representative. Right? Who might actually probably be different than Mr. Z's representative. Right? All three of us have different representatives because we live in different representative districts. Okay? That means we are constituents of different individuals. Right? You're not the uh, Crenshaw, are you? No, I'm, I think I'm Latrell. Latrell? Yeah. Oh, you're in with like. <clears throat> the brother of. Is it Morton? Well, the guy from Last Survivor is his brother. No, okay. no, no. Okay. I don't, I don't even know who my representative is now. I know who Mr. Kennedy is. Yeah, yeah, That's why I wouldn't hear. Because I, I, I mean, I know that different from. Okay. So, listen. Next. This one really matters. I need you to understand this. Federalism. Okay. Federalism is, the, is another separation of power. It's another division. Yes. Okay, except now, instead of separating powers at the national level, now I have the national government and state governments. Right? So now we're going to divide power between the national government and the state government. Again, trying to ensure that the national government does not overexert its authority or does not become tyrannical in nature. Okay? Um, finally, the Bill of Rights is a limitation on power, okay? Albeit probably an unnecessary, no, probably a necessary one, but a, an inaccurate, a failure? A, what's the word I'm looking for? The Bill of Rights is bad, okay? Why? That's an excellent question, man. So you all understand the Bill of Rights, you have freedom of speech, yes? Yes. Everybody think that's essential? That's really important, right? Yes, if you don't have freedom of speech, you're not free. I need you to realize that. You're not free if you don't have freedom of speech. Yes? Okay, so you have uh, you have the right to a trial by jury. That's, a, that's pretty important, right? Can't just be thrown in jail without a trial. Right? What about your right to privacy? Yeah, you have one of those? No, 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 I mean in the Constitution. Yes? Where, sir? It doesn't exist. Isn't that one of your unalienable rights? I would argue that it is. But the problem is it's not codified in the Constitution, meaning it's not listed, it's not stated. Meaning it doesn't exist. Meaning, meaning here's the thing, right? At some point in time, a justice in the Supreme Court decided they found, they found the right to an abortion. 
right? They decided in Roe versus Wade that, that women had the right to an abortion. They just found it. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Constitution. But they said, well, that makes sense, right? And then what happened in the future? Somebody else said, nope, that don't make sense. You don't have a right now, okay? Here's the problem. At any point in time, somebody could theoretically come back and be like, you have a right to privacy. The government can spy on you all at once. They absolutely do. Yeah, the Patriot Act is terrible. Okay? But this is actually what makes the Bill of Rights slightly dicey. But you need to understand that the Bill of Rights is a limitation on governmental power because they cannot like prevent you from exercising your religion. They cannot uh, prevent you from speaking your mind. Right? There are limitations. It's also important for you to understand that the Bill of Rights is also a constitutional compromise. Right? The Federalists wanted the Constitution. The Anti-Federalists did not want the Constitution. The Bill of Rights was a necessary, uh, 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 yeah, like it, was a, it was a concession on the part of the Federalists. Right? They wrote the Bill of Rights in order to try to get the Anti-Federalists to agree to it. <clears throat> All right. So understand that it is both a limitation on governmental power and a constitutional compromise at the same time. So that brings us into the individual like aspects of the Constitution. We're going to start with legislative branch. That is Article One. Okay, it is important. Not that any of you have probably opened your textbook, but if you had opened your textbook, right, and you went all the way to the back and you looked in the appendix, you would actually find the totality of the Constitution of the United States of America, the entire thing written in the back of that textbook. Anybody want to guess how many pages it is? Six hundred. <laughs> no. Four. Yeah. Four. The entire Constitution is four pages, and mind you, the last two pages, almost the entirety of the last two pages, are all of the amendments. The actual Constitution is basically two pages in your textbook. Okay. That's it. Article one is half the Constitution. Okay. There's only seven articles. Article one is half the Constitution, which also means that if we're being honest, right? And we should, we should be honest in life, right? Here's Congress. Right? Oh, this isn't the size of the building. This is the amount of power that they have. President. Because you have to pour the power in. Supreme Court. The judicial branch. Art, just so we're crystal clear, we separated powers, yes? Did we separate them evenly? No. No. Congress is supposed to be our most powerful branch of government. Yes, ma'am. Is Congress like House Oversight? Yes, ma'am. Okay. The House and the Senate combined. That's the legislative branch. But all the other folks call it executive branch. Next year in government. Okay. We'll, we'll have a whole day on executive orders. So you would say it was like the most powerful branch? Or Congress is supposed to be. Yeah. Okay. Congress makes the laws. Making the laws should be the most powerful part of our government. The problem is Congress doesn't do its job anymore. This is a conversation next year for government. Congress outsources its job, like all good Americans. Congress basically makes somebody else do their job for them. The bureaucracy and, and the president. None of you none of you have ever questioned why we have a law called Obamacare. Obama was president. President. He was not a congressman. No. President. Why is the president writing the law? He doesn't write the laws. Congress writes the laws. Wait, Obamacare? Yes. It is. It's a law about health care. Do you have to have Obamacare? No, no, no. You have to have health insurance. It's a part of what is called the Affordable Care Act. But the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare are the same thing. Most most laws, most laws have like catchy names that people will like, like DACA or like the like Dreamers. 
like those are lulls. Like dream stands for like deferred. No, DACA is deferred action of children arrivals or something like that. Meaning that if you come here, like if your parents immigrate to the United States and you're like two, if they come here, let's say you say the same word, if they come here legally, right? If you come here at two and then we find you like 20 years later and now you're 22, are we really going to send you back to a country that you have never been to in your like life? Yes. <laughs> okay, no, 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 like, I mean, there's a lot of people who want to stay in that question. DAC, DACA is meant, DACA is meant, the deferred action is to meant to give those people an opportunity to actually become citizens, because this for me is the only country they've honestly ever known. You understand that? But like, laws, a law of care is a law. It's called the Affordable Care Act, and anything that says act is legislation, okay? But again, <coughs> Obama wrote a law. All right, you'll learn this next year. Literally, like, he wrote the law. They printed it out. It was a thousand pages long, right? They gave it to Nancy Pelosi, who was Speaker of the House, at, like, 3 o'clock in the morning. At 9 a.m., Nancy Pelosi was like, we got to vote on this. We got to pass this law so that we know what it says. Excuse me, ma'am. You didn't read it? Like, you didn't read it? No? Okay. No, no Congress doesn't even read the laws that they vote on anymore. They just, you know, they just, they, they just say, hey, let's go for all. Right? Okay. All right. So, Article 1 is the legislative branch. That is the House and the Senate. And I need you to understand now. Again, right? Because you see, if this is my actual like diagram here, and these are all the powers, yeah, I need you to understand this is too much. So, we're really going to divide this, and we're going to put the House here and the Senate here. Okay? And you'll see this next year in government class in detail. I teach government. As really five different things, right? We have five branches of government, not three. Okay, the bureaucracy. We don't need to know that for this class. We're not even. I'm not even touching that today. Okay. So the House has two-year terms. The Senate has six-year terms. The next thing I need you to know. This is probably going to be tested. Right? Listen to me. You see these four things up here. Okay, it's 1787, we're writing the Constitution of the United States. How many of these do people get to vote for? Let's take me, right? I'm an I'm a old white dude with land, right? How many of these people do I get to vote for? One. Which one? No, I don't get to vote for the president. Okay, how many of these people do I get to vote for in November this year? One, three. Two, three. You get to vote for your Two. I vote for the House and I vote for the Senate. You don't get to vote for the president. No, the, the representatives vote. The Electoral College votes for the president of the United States. They actually can, but y'all understand, right? Like Hillary Clinton beat Donald Trump. She got more votes. Did she become president? No. No, because we the people don't vote for the president of the United States. We're okay. Okay. We'll, we'll get to this next year. You're telling you're telling the electoral college what to do, right? It's more just indirect democracy. You're sort of telling the electoral college what to do, and then the electoral college theoretically does what you're telling them to do, right? But you are not you are not voting directly. We're not voting directly for president of the United States. So now again, listen to me. Because I need you to understand, we've got this this history, right? It's 1787. I've got these four things. Yes. How many do I get to vote for? Two. One. One. So I'll write down one. Oh, this is So wait, that's all you write. All you write. So listen. When we wrote the Constitution, senators are appointed by state legislatures. Okay, now, sometime in like February, you'll learn that we change the Constitution and we get to vote for senators now. Okay, but today, today it's 1787 and we're writing the Constitution, yes? You only get a vote for the House of Representatives. So now, as we're dividing our powers, we're separating power in our new government that we're creating, we have separated power here as well. Okay? These people are elite, right? And they're elite because they represent state government. They don't represent people. Oh, so like Troy Nelson. Troy Nelson is our representative. That's the House. Yes. Ted Cruz is here. 
Yes, ma'am. Um, did you say the Senate is appointed by the governor? Appointed by state legislators. State legislators, okay. Right? So state, like, okay. again, 1787, not that Texas is a country yet, or state yet, right? 1787, what? We're still part of Spain, yeah? Okay? Go to Virginia. In Virginia, in 1787, the two Virginia senator, senators are appointed by the Virginia State Legislature, which we know used to be called the House of Burgesses, right? Can we remember that? Okay, so here's what we have to understand, okay? We don't really get a say here, yes? These people are elite representing governmental interests. So because they represent governmental interests, they're gonna be more tied closely to the president. And this is the concept called advice and consent. President wants to nominate somebody to the Supreme Court, right? Who has to tell him he can do it? The Senate. Senate, right? Okay, these people get six year terms to the two year terms here, right? So what makes the house unique? The specific authority to the house that you need to understand is that the house of representatives is one who controls money right and hopefully we've talked about this at least a little bit yes does government make money yeah. no yeah. government cannot make money government cannot create wealth it can only take wealth that's why they tax okay it can print money but that's different that's not creating wealth and so i'm using money and wealth differently yeah. right they cannot generate wealth all they can do is take wealth and they take wealth in the form of taxes yes yeah. So the U.S. government takes money from me. I'm not real happy about it, but I, you know, whatever. I don't have a choice, okay? But if the U.S. government is taking money from me, I would like to have some say in how that money is being spent, right? The only way, how do I have say? <coughs> this is it. This is the only one I have say in because it's the only one I can vote for, so all monetary issues have to start here. We understand? It's the idea that everything that we've done, everything we've done in creating this country is all done intentionally, right? Everything is nuanced and detailed and everything is intentional, right? The founding fathers made mistakes, make no mistake about that, right? But they did not accidentally do something, right? If they did it, they thought it was in the best interest. They thought it was in the best interest to not have these people be elected. Right? Ultimately, we decided that they were wrong. Okay? What? Now? Now you have to get elected. But, but people. So if you were 18, not that anyone's in here or 18, but like in, in 19 days, I will have a choice between Ted Cruz or Colin Allred. Right? Those are the two. I don't tell people who I vote for. No, no, it's okay. I don't mind you asking. Right? And, and I mean, this is a conversation for government next year, but here's, here's my general philosophy, and I'll tell you, don't ever tell anybody you vote for. Right? If I told you who I was voting for for President of the United States, it's not going to change your opinion about that individual. Right? You're not going to change your mind about Donald Trump or Kamala Harris if I told you who I was voting for. But you might change your opinion of me. Right? And I wouldn't want that. Okay? So. Hey, I told y'all there's nothing I do unintentionally either, is there? It's true. Everything I do is intentional, okay? We're gonna have to stop here, but I need you to go through the end of article, or the last thing we know in Article 1. Article 1, Section 8 covers all the powers that Congress has. Sit down, man. Oh, no, sit, you don't need to. You can throw it away on your way out in like 30 seconds, okay? You have express powers and implied powers. If I were to read it to you, you create an army and a navy. Can you create an air force? Yeah. It's not in the Constitution because airplanes didn't exist, but it makes sense, right? Yeah. That's implied. Good. Go. Have a good day. Yes. Yeah. Officer, like, what is this like?